Good afternoon, my friends. This is Paul, and today we're going to be looking at Banjo and Kazooie making their way into Smash and how absolutely perfectly the Smash team was able to absolutely nail their portrayal. In fact, not only did they do a good job of transitioning Banjo and Kazooie from their 3D platforming games into a 2D fighting game, but I am going to make the case here in this video that they actually were transitioned the best from their home series into Smash. An argument could be made for Mr. Game & Watch, since his animations are all based on their games, or the Wii Fit Trainer because their moves are actual yoga moves, but you also have to take into account the context of the original experience versus how well it transitions into a Smash move set. And as you're about to see, they did a pretty darn good job. So how about we start out with their design and their moves. The design that is used for Smash is very faithful to how they appeared in Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie on the Nintendo 64. Most fans, myself included, weren't a huge fan of how they got a redesign in Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. It felt like kind of like what an incompetent studio would design a character for the PlayStation as. So I'm glad that they respected the fans, and the only nod to Nuts and Bolts that I could see was one of their taunts. But apart from that, let's look at some of the moves they use in Smash and contrast them to their original games. <laughs> Okay, so I forgot the forward roll, but that's pretty easy to imagine because you've seen Link do it enough in the 3D Zelda games. So now let's move on to their stage, Spiral Mountain. So the stage pick, Spiral Mountain, is actually the opening training area in Banjo-Kazooie, which also makes a return in Banjo-Tooie and Grunty's Revenge. And the stage looks absolutely gorgeous. I think they might have used the general graphic style that Nuts and Bolts had, but I've never played that game, and I think a lot of us want to forget it, so I'm just going to pretend that Smash was just completely original in their design here. The central gimmick of the stage is that the stage itself spirals while the characters are still on a 2D plane, so it kind of has that combination of 3D and 2D. And even though Spiral Mountain itself doesn't spiral, it is a spiral pathway leading up to the top, so I think the stage wanted to reflect that in a more creative way. What's really cool about the design of the stage is that even the background is full of so much little stuff that adds up to really make it feel like this is an authentic recreation of the original stage. If you get to Banjo's house in the background, you'll see that the extra life trophy is hovering above the chimney. You'll also see that the honeycomb rings, or extra honeycomb pieces, as they call them in the game, are all in the original spots. And then there's the cameos. Now, they took a little bit of a creative liberty here because most of these characters didn't actually appear on the Spiral Mountain stage, but I think it was more so the fact that they wanted to fit in popular banjo characters, and 
it would have been too much of a hassle to create multiple banjo stages. So you've got Gruntilda, the Buzz Bombs, the Jinjos, Bottles, uh, Mumbo Jumbo, and even Tootie, if you look in the background. And a lot of their animations are a bit more sophisticated than what you would expect on the Nintendo 64. Like, Mumbo does not juggle his own eyeballs on the Nintendo 64. But it still feels like the models and the animations are faithful enough to what Banjo-Kazooie could have been had it originally released on the Nintendo 64. Speaking of characters, let's move on to their spirit battles. So let's start out with the Jiggy. This is the main collectible in the Banjo-Kazooie series and is even Banjo and Kazooie's icon when you're fighting as them. And, and their victory screen also has them picking up a Jiggy. In fact, their victory jingle is actually the tune that plays in Banjo-Kazooie when you first get a Jiggy. The Jiggy is supposed to be a jigsaw piece, and it's used to unlock the different worlds. So having a golden Kirby makes sense, because it's kind of hard to find a character that's shaped exactly like a jigsaw piece, but Kirby has that circular design that works well enough here. Now, you, have, you face five golden Kirbys on Great Cave Offensive with the Treasure Trove Cove remix playing. It's called Treasure Trove Cove because there's a side quest in Treasure Trove Cove where Banjo and Kazooie find an X on the ground. And after they beak bomb the X, then an arrow will point showing where the next X is. So then they have to jump on the flying pad and fly to the next X and keep doing that over and over again until one of the X's turns into a question mark. So then they have to go over to a nearby island and use the beak barge to bust open the treasure chest to get a jiggy. I'm pretty sure the reason why this event is timed is just to make it more fun because you don't actually have a time limit in the original game. But the reason why the Kirby's are so spread apart is because of how far Banjo and Kazooie have to fly to get to each of the X's. I also thought it was cool how the Kirby's don't actually put up a fight, they just kind of jump up and down and then slowly fall. Just like when you trigger an event that summons a Jiggy, it'll make the Jiggy sort of bounce a little bit. So it's trying to convey the idea that you're getting multiple Jiggies. Then I also think it's a cool touch that Great Cave Offensive was used because it gives that sense of jogging to hurry up like the state, like Treasure Trove Cove did, but it also has treasure chests, which Treasure Trove Cove had a lot of chests that tried to eat you, so I presume that was probably what the lava was supposed to represent. Tootie is Banjo's sister, who actually only appears in Banjo-Kazooie, surprisingly. She just disappears in Banjo-Tooie without any explanation. She's kidnapped by Gruntilda at the beginning of the game, because she's too pretty and Gruntilda is jealous of her looks. So her plan is to swap her ugliness with Tootie's beauty so that Grunty will be beautiful and Tootie will be ugly. So Diddy Kong is used to represent Tootie here because there's not really another bear character. And also Diddy Kong's Dixie-related color scheme seems to fit with the fact that Tootie wears a purple jumpsuit. Now... The descriptor of the spirit battle says that Diddy's shield has extra power. I'm not 100% sure what this is supposed to reference here because, again, Tootie is kind of more of the rescue her. She doesn't really do a whole lot. But if I had to guess, I think it's related to the fact that while Tootie is in captivity, there are these electronic bars that are keeping her within the beauty swapping machine so that she can't escape. So I think the shield is supposed to represent the fact that she's held in captivity. You also have Banjo and Kazooie jumping in to help Diddy Kong, which is, of course, a reference to the fact that Banjo is Tootie's brother and that he is going on this whole quest in the first place to save her. The Jinjos are a breed of bird that appear in sets of five in Banjo-Kazooie. Once you collect all of them, they'll drop a Jiggy. In Banjo-Tooie, it's a bit more complicated as there are varying numbers of Jinjo colors, which is why I'm glad they took the Banjo-Kazooie approach here because that would be a pretty annoying spirit battle. For them, you fight them on Omega Summit, which is a reference to Freezy's Peak. I think they just wanted an excuse to reference Freezy's Peak because that's such a beautiful Christmas-themed level, and 
Summit just works really well here because they have the northern lights in the background, which are kind of like the lights of the Christmas tree. So the Jinjos are really easy to defeat at first, representing how the Jinjos are kind of helpless in Banjo-Kazooie. But then you face a giant Mr. Game & Watch that can deal damage to you by dashing into you. This is actually a direct reference to the final battle of Banjo-Kazooie, where after you've dealt enough damage to Gruntilda, she'll have an invincible shield around her. And then you'll have the mighty Ginginator be summoned as a statue. And in order to free him from his stony prison, you'll have to shoot eggs into each of the holes on the base of the statue, and then he'll come alive and he'll essentially perform Banjo and Kazooie's final smash on Gruntilda, therefore winning the battle. The Bottles Spirit Battle cracked me up because I couldn't believe they went for such an obscure reference. So Bottles the Mole is your tutorial character in Banjo-Kazooie and modern games could really take a hint from Bottles because he asks you if you want to go through Spiral Mountain to learn the different moves or if you just want to be given them right away and then just get straight into the action. So I really wish that there were options like that in games like Skyward Sword, where it seems like they really handhold you. So Bottles being a mole, he has different mole hills scattered throughout the game. And when you find a mole hill, then you go up to it and press B and then Bottles will pop out and he'll teach you a new maneuver. And this is why there are so many pitfall items and also why Donkey Kong, the spirit used to represent him, is constantly headbutting you into the ground to represent Bottles digging. He even starts out with a black hole item so that he can suck you in, which could be a reference to the fact that Bottles gets sucked into his own molehill after he's done teaching you the move, but it could also represent the Big O Blaster that is used for Gruntilda to suck up the life out of the Isle of Hags in Banjo-Tooie, as Bottles is killed off right away in Banjo-Tooie, which is why Donkey Kong sometimes turns invisible to represent that Bottles is now a spirit. And of course, the music choice being Spiral Mountain is perfect here because that's where you see Bottles the most, as it's a tutorial stage and Bottles is a tutorial character. Mumbo Jumbo is a shaman that you meet in the Banjo series that transforms Banjo and Kazooie into various objects or creatures depending on the world. However, in Banjo-Tooie, they wanted Mumbo to be a playable character, so they had Humble Wumba take over the transformations. And instead, Mumbo, once you control him, has the ability to zap enemies with his wand, which is probably why he was represented by a Mii sword fighter wearing Skull Kid clothes, because that most accurately represented how a shaman with a skull for a face would appear. However, they went the extra mile and decided that they were going to reference the Golden Goliath in Mayahem Temple, which is the first level in Banjo-Tooie, where Mumbo summons this giant golden statue, and the statue can kick things open, and of course it's humongous, like it makes the rest of the levels look small, which is why it's re represented by Rob, because Rob himself is kind of a golem. And it's golden, because it's, well, the golden Goliath. Now, as for why you're flowery, I think that's just, uh, I think that's just Mumbo magic cornering you. Because one of Mumbo's spells in Banjo-Tooie is to 
deactivate a crushing system in Grunty Industries. So I think that was the reference here. I might be stretching it. I could be stretching it even more by saying that in the game over sequence of Banjo-Kazooie, Mumbo tries giving flowers to Gruntilda because she succeeds at being beautiful. Now, the stage, Jungle Japes, is most likely a reference to the flowing river in Mayahem Temple, with the stage where Golden Goliath appears in, because unlike the water in Mumble's Mountain, which is what the music would suggest, that's still water, whereas the water is actually a flowing river in Mayahem Temple. So overall, a pretty solid spirit battle. The Buzz Bomb is an enemy that is first found in Bubble Goop Swamp, and then appears later in Click Clock Wood. And I believe that the stage picked for their spirit battle, Garden of Hope, is representing kind of sort of both of those stages. Because there are elements of the stage that's kind of like a swamp, but also like a forest. So that makes sense. And I've seen it used as a forest in some other spirit battles. So that does make a lot of sense. They chose Ridley because Ridley kind of looks a little bit like a dragonfly. I mean, Ridley is kind of a dragon to begin with. And his up special has him charging toward the player, just like how when the buzz bomb spots Banjo and Kazooie, it'll zoom toward them. Now, I forgot to film the buzz bomb in action, but I think it's pretty easy to visualize a dragonfly zooming at you, as I'm sure you've had that happen to you in real life. The Spiral Mountain remix doesn't exactly fit here in context, because they don't actually appear on Spiral Mountain. But I think that was the team's way of hinting at the fact that they appear in Click Clock Wood, which has a very upbeat sound to it that Spiral Mountain sounds the closest to. But hey, I'm not complaining. Spiral Mountain was done by Grant Kirkhope, the original composer. How could you get anyone better than that? Finally, we have Gruntilda, the main antagonist in the Banjo series, having her design from Banjo-Kazooie because in Banjo-Tooie, after she's released from her rock prison, she's become a skeleton, and so the plot of that game is to suck up enough life energy from the Isle of Hags to restore her old body. Now, in the reveal trailer for Banjo-Kazooie, they actually used King K. Rule to represent Gruntilda, which I think makes more sense. His crocodile skin looks a lot like how Gruntilda is a, a green witch. However, the reason why I think they switched it to King Dedede representing her in her spirit battle was to represent Gruntilda's broomstick, because his hammer kind of looks like a broom, and there's a move in Gruntilda's final battle where she kind of charges at Banjo and Kazooie. Now, as for the other elements of the stage, the stage is Find Me, which is sort of a final level atmosphere to it. So it's referencing how you fight Gruntilda on top of Gruntilda's tower, which has this thunder and lightning ominous background that's playing, just like how Find Me kind of has that climactic thunder and lightning background. The Poison Floor is a reference to the final battle in Bound of Tui, where after you've gotten to a certain point in the battle, Gruntilda will unleash poisonous gas into the battlefield, which will rapidly deplete Banjo and Kazooie's air bubbles, which after that's been depleted, will start draining their health. The reason why there are three Dr. Marios that appear is in reference to Gruntilda's assistant, Klungo, who you have to fight three different times in Banjo Kazooie, in Banjo Tooie's campaign before you can get to Gruntilda. And the reason why Dr. Mario keeps shooting Mega Vitamins is because while Klungo has his shield up, he will constantly toss potions at Banjo and Kazooie. So I thought that was a nice little touch, and they even had the Klungo battle music remix being used here to sort of draw attention to the fact that that was a reference. Even further confirmation is the fact that Dr. Mario is wearing his green jacket, just like a Klungo skin is green colored. Banjo and Kazooie's classic mode at first glance seems a bit predictable. Banjo and Kazooie are constantly seen together in Banjo Kazooie and for most of Banjo Tooie, so it would make sense that the characters they face are also partners. But they added a twist to this so that it didn't seem identical to the Ice Climbers' classic mode route, and that's that each of the stages are references to levels in Banjo Kazooie, with the exception of the last two battles, but we'll get to that when we do. The first battle is against Duck Hunt on Spiral Mountain, which is a clever nod to the fact that Duck Hunt was the fake out character used in Banjo and Kazooie's reveal trailer 
And this may be a little bit of a conspiracy theory on my part, but I also believe that Duck Hunt was meant to be a replacement of Banjo and Kazooie during Smash 3DS and Wii U because they didn't have the rights at the time, or maybe they were just being stubborn. I don't know. And the main theme Banjo Kazooie is playing because Duck Hunt is representing Banjo and Kazooie to begin with. The next battle is Rosalina and Luma on Tortimer Island with the Treasure Trove Cove remix playing. The music tends to give away what the stage is, so because the music is Treasure Trove Cove, that's exactly what it's representing. Tortimer Island is an island, just as uh, Treasure Trove Cove is a beach level. Next up, we have the Ice Climbers on the summit with Freeze Easy Peak playing. Freeze Easy Peak is a snowy level that has a lot of Christmas themes playing. Next is Link and Zelda on Mushroomy Kingdom to represent the desert world, Gobi's Valley. Then we have Fox and Falco on Luigi's Mansion with Mad Monster Mansion playing. And do I even need to say it? Mad Monster Mansion, Luigi's Mansion. It's like the two were made for each other. Now why Fox and Falco are dark colored is probably because Mad Monster Mansion is supposed to be spooky. So they had their dark colors to represent the darkness of the level. Now this last one is more so a reference to Rareware as a company than as a banjo level because you face Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong on Jungle Japes with the Donkey Kong Country Returns main theme playing. This is referencing the fact that Rareware, the company that developed Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, also developed the Donkey Kong Country games, so it's establishing the Rareware connection. The final battle is kind of lame. It's just against Master Hand and Crazy Hand on Final Destination. I kind of wish that maybe they would have done the Gruntilda final battle, like maybe had Banjo and Kazooie face off against King K. Rule on Find Me, like that would have fit more personally, but that also would have broken the theme because King K. Rule doesn't really have a partner character. So overall it was okay. Maybe if they changed the music or made it the versus Klungo theme, that would have made more sense to keep with the theme of having familiar music, but overall a pretty solid classic mode route. You may have noticed that I haven't talked about the music yet and how well the remixes are done, and that's because I'm way ahead of you guys. In my Smash Music Origins videos, I managed to do a side-by-side, -side, or not a side-by-side, -side. I managed to film the context with which the original music was played and what level it was being played on. So you'll be able to see Spiral Mountain, Mumbles Mountain, Treasure Trove Cove, Freeze Easy Peak, Mad Monster Mansion, Gobi's Valley. The Banjo Tooie one I haven't uploaded yet, but if all goes as planned, I will upload it simultaneously with this video as a kind of treat to be like, hey, you wanted a deep dive into Banjo Kazooie? Let's look into Banjo Tooie's music. I wasn't particularly good at the boss battles in Banjo Tooie because that's the only music selection they had because Banjo Tooie's music was a lot more atmospheric. But overall, it was a fantastic music selection, not a single dud in the pack. I personally would have liked to see Click Clock Wood make an appearance, but hey, the fact that we got Banjo at all, I'm just happy for everything. So in conclusion, Banjo and Kazooie were handled absolutely magnificently. The cameos, the stage, the spirits, the classic mode route, everything felt like such a loving tribute to the bear and bird. And it makes me so happy that their original game, and hopefully Banjo-Tooie as well, are coming to Nintendo Switch Online. So now, if you don't want to watch this video, you can go ahead and experience their adventures for yourself. So with that, thank you very much for watching. If I somehow missed out on anything, please let me know down in the comment section. And I'd like to again thank Loves 459 for the suggestion for this video. And until the next time, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless, and the bear and bird and smash! That's never gonna get old. Bye!